Hi. It's your internet grandpa here. And we're going to try and read the last chapter of Carry On Mr. Bowditch today. It's a book written by Gene Lee Latham. It's, uh, I'd call it historic fiction. I mean, we don't know that these things actually happened to Mr. Nathaniel Bowditch, but he was a real person. And the basis of the story is uh, true. Um, certainly all these uh, conversations are pro were not written down and not recorded as true, but uh, it's a good story. I'm enjoying it. I hope you are too. So, chapter 24. It's the last chapter. It's called Man Against the Fog. And remember, they were trying to get back to Salem, and they ran into stormy weather. It took them two months longer than they planned. And then the worst of it came. So we'll read the last little bit of conversation. And Nate said, the rain's letting up. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Denny was grim. This is worse. Worse? Yes, sir. Fog. He shook his head slowly from side to side. I've seen fog in my days, but this one, he shrugged, and his shrug was a shiver. Fog. Morning came, but no sunlight. The only man, way a man could know the day had come was because the fog turned pale. You ever been in a fog like that? It's just this gray, pale, everything. It's just like you're in the middle of a soup or something. I don't know. From a midship, a man could not see the bow. He could not even see the foremast. The lookouts strained to see what lay before them, shook their heads in despair. If anything's there, one muttered, we'll find it when we hit it. Eight bells came, the starboard watch lay below. In the forecastle, the men huddled and slewed sidelong glances at each other. When they spoke, they growled in low voices as though the fog that shrouded the world had muffled their words. Jensen came below from his trick at the wheel. You know what the old man said to me? The men looked up without speaking, without moving their heads. He came alongside me, stood there watching the compass. He said, you have a steady on the wheel, Chad. You have a steady hand on the wheel, Chad. Your wake is straight as a string. Corey's voice rose and cracked. How does he know? He can't see our wake, can he? Can't see anything. Jensen nodded. That's what I said to him. I said, maybe, sir, if we could see it. You know what he said to me? He said, we don't have to see it to know that, do we, Jensen? We just watch the compass and know. Simple matter of mathematics, isn't it? And he went below again, cool as you please. Corey shook his head as a dog shakes when it comes out of, out of the water. <laughs> Three days with no sun, no moon, no stars to tell us where we are. Jensen stopped smiling. Getting thicker, too, he shook his head. I'd as soon play blind men's bluff on a cliff as sail through this fog. Watson stared at the deck. All right, maybe if we had sea room, but what do we know about where we are now? Corey slumped forward, his elbows on his knees, his hands dangling. Three days of zigging and zagging. Makes your muscles pull just thinking about it. How many times we've hauled around on another tack. Zig and zag, zig and zag. How can a body expect to know where we are? I tried parasailing once. You get this little, it's like a surfboard and you put a, it's got a sail mounted on it. It's kind of tough going into the wind. Jensen grinned wryly. We've had plenty of practice most of the way home. Ought to be used to it. Maybe. Corey's voice cracked again. We had sea room then, sea room. But we're off Nantucket Shoals 10 days ago. Where are we now? Jensen gripped Corey's soldiers. shoulder. Easy, lad. Maybe the fog will lift. But the fog did not lift. Eight bells bonged, bong bonged, and it was noon. Fog grew thicker. Eight bells is noon? I'm going to have to figure out how bells work sometime. I think I knew that once. The fog was thicker. 
All around was a ghost world now. From forward, ghost voices of the leadsmen chanted, chanted the soundings. From aft, ghost voices spoke of men as men heaved the log and turned the glass. The wind freshened and blew in fitful gusts. Jensen said, good, it'll blow the fog away. But it did not. It only blew more clouds of fog to roil and billow over the Putnam. Along about three bells, Nate came on deck with his spyglass and went to the larboard rail. The word passed swiftly. Something's up. The old man's taking charge. Mr. Denny stood at Nate's shoulder. Impossible to see anything, isn't it, sir? Nate answered without turning. If the fog lifts one half minute, we can see it. Mr. Denny stared into the fog, too. Three minutes crawled by. The ghost bell marked the lead, leaden-footed time. Bong, 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 bong. Mr. Denny shifted his feet and sighed. Nate was motionless. His glass never wavered from the point toward which he star stared. The brief day began to darken. Eight bells again. The starboard watch was relieved. Mr. Watson said, the old man's watching for something. Suppose it's the light on Baker's Island? Corey shouted, Baker's Island? Are you crazy? Think we'll get close enough to Baker's Island to see the light in this fog and fetch up on the rock somewhere? You crazy fools. Ever seen a ship on Gale's Ledge or Whale's Back? Baker's Island light, you crazy fool? Jensen gripped Corey's shoulder again. Easy, lad. We've got sea room. Ain't anywhere near Baker's Island. Through the white ghost of world, they heard Nate's voice. That's it, Mr. Denny, Baker's Island. We're exactly on our course. Jensen gasped. Corey whimpered and muttered a prayer. Jensen said, we'll anchor now, lad. We'll stand off till the fog lifts. Nate's voice spoke again through the fog. Two men on the chains, Mr. Denny, and keep heaving those leads. He moved briskly to the side of the helmsman. West, northwest, by west. Aye, aye, sir. West, northwest, by west, it is, sir. Night came again. Darkness and fog shrouded the Putnam. Nate stood near the compass, holding his watch so that he could read the face on the glow of the binnacle lamp. Watson, in the labored chain, sang out, By the deep ten! From the starboard chains, Kid Kedzie yelled, And a quarter less four! The helmsman stared at the compass. His knuckles whitened on the wheel. Somewhere in the mist, Corey gasped, It's shoaling! Nate's gaze never left his watch. He lifted one finger, as though with one finger he could control the wind and the waves that hurled a ship, a crew, and 300 tons of cargo toward the waiting rocks. Now, due west. Due west it is, sir. The minutes crawled. The ship's bell bong-bonged. Kedzie rumbled. By the deep six. In the foggy darkness, someone tried to laugh, and it sounded like a sob. Watson sang out, and a half less six. Nate stared at his watch. He lifted his finger again. Kedzie yelled, by the deep four. Nate said, west by north. The helmsman swung the wheel hard, growled at himself, and steadied on course. West by north it is, sir. No sound but the ship's bell now. Watson's sing song came through the darkness. By the mark five. And Kedzie rumbled. And Kedzie's rumble answered. By the mark five. Jensen said the old man goes ahead like it was noonday. He, Watson sing song again. And a half less five. Kedzie rumbled answered. And a half less five. Watson's voice sharpened. And a quarter less three. Nate gave no sign that he'd heard. He stared at his watch. Kedzie's voice again. And a quarter less three. Nate said, steady as you go. Watson yelled. And a half less three. Somewhere in the fog, Corey screamed. It's shoaling, I tell you. We're going aground. We'll be beaten to pieces. Nate did not raise his eyes. He hardly lifted his voice to say, Mr. Sanchez, it would be a kindness if Corey could sleep. <laughs>
I think Mr. Sanchez is going to knock Corey up the side of the head and let him sleep for a while. Ooh. Lupe purred. Aye, aye, sir. And in the darkness, a fist thudded. A body hit the deck. A slurring scrape said someone was dragging the sleeping Corey forward. <laughs> That's not exactly what I'd call sleeping, but okay. Nate lifted his finger again. Southwest by south. In the big white as in the big white house facing the common. The tall truck clock struck nine. Polly rose from her Polly rose from her place by the fire, went to the window, shaded her eyes from the light, and stared out into the mist. Lim Harvey looked up and shook his head. It's no use, Miss Spodich, ma'am. Won't be any ships making port tonight. Polly sighed and turned from the window. I know, but I did so hope he'd be home Christmas Day. Better pray now he don't come, Polly gasped. Lim, what do you mean? Nothing, ma'am, just that the only sailor to turn up on Salem tonight would be by land because he'd be wrecked somewhere and put ashore. Lim, that what's happened? What are you keeping from me? Nothing, ma'am. There is something, she insisted. That's why you came tonight. What's happened, Lim? His black eye met Polly's gaze squarely. I swear, ma'am, it's nothing like that. I just came because, well, I got to thinking about you. I knew the folks was away and you were alone in the house. I just got to thinking about you alone on Christmas night, ma'am. That's all. It's the only reason I swear it. You believe me, don't you, ma'am? Yes, Lem, I believe you. For a few minutes, she sat by the fire, staring into the glow. Then she was at the window again, staring into the blank wall of fog. Lim said, honest, Mrs. Bowditch. Polly turned from the window. I know. You're right, Lim. Of course you're right. She stared, started back to her chair, stopped, whirled, and stood motionless, listening. I could swear I heard Loopy call out. If you did, ma'am, it was his ghost. This time, Polly clutched his arm and sh shook it. Lim, what is it? You've got to tell me. Lim stood. Nothing, ma'am. Only that the putman in ain't coming in. I mean, she ain't coming tonight. You got sense enough to know that, ma'am. There's some things a master just can't do, and bringing his ship into Salem Harbor in fog like this one, I tell you, where are you going, ma'am? Polly didn't answer. She hurried into the hall, flugged a big wide door open, flugged a big, flood the, flung the big door wide, and stood there, staring into the fog. From the fog, Nate's voice called, Polly, is that you? Nate, oh, Nate, darling. She raced up the steps. He raced up the steps and had her in his arms. Oh, Polly, it's so good to be home. After a little, he chuckled. Good thing you opened the door, though. The fog's so thick. <laughs> the fog's so thick, I might have gone right past the house. Still chuckling, his arm around Polly, he closed the door and went in by the fire. Why, Lim, how good to see you. So here he is. <laughs> <laughs> he sailed into the harbor in the fog and the dark, but he couldn't find his own house. <laughs> oh, my. At first, Lem didn't answer. He only stared, his jaw sagging. I imagine his mouth stood open. It's really you. What happened? Where's the Putnam? Nate tossed off his jacket. Right down in Salem Harbor, riding to anchor. He stood by the fire, rubbing his hands. Why? You came in through this fog? Polly said, when it's so thick, you almost missed the house. Nate shrugged. Oh, that's different. On the Putnam, I had a log, lead, and lookout. He grinned. Not that the lookout's been seeing much. Lim growled. When did you last shoot the sun? Mm, about three days ago. Lim gulped. Three days? 72 hours. And since then? It's simply mathematics, Lim. At such a speed, in so many hours, you log so many miles in a given direction. It's, yeah, Lim growled. 72 hours through the roaring 40s. 72 hours by dead reckoning. And then you enter Salem Harbor. Why, you, begging your pardon, ma'am, for what I was thinking. He slumped in a chair and stared at Nate. Nate winked at Polly. Have you any idea what's the matter with him? Polly's eyes danced. 
He just doesn't understand about you and mathematics, dear. Two plus two is four. It comes out right, doesn't it? Lim shifted his chair and growled under his breath. Hurrying footsteps thudded on the porch. A heavy fist hammered at the door. Polly went to open it. Zach Selby entered, panting, talking as he came. I'm sorry about the bad news, ma'am. Someone said they saw him on the street. I'm sorry he lost the Putman, Putnam man. He, Lim roared, come in and stop bellowing, you fool. The Putnam's riding at anchor in Salem Harbor. Zach stared at Nate. You, you come in through the fog? How'd you do it? Lim threw back his shoulders and bellowed. How'd you think he did it? Book sailing, simple matter of mathematics. He picked up his jacket and cap. I'd better explain things to folks or you two won't get any rest tonight. Come on, Zach. The door slammed. Polly's lips quirked. Quirked. She got kind of a funny smile. Lim's going to have a wonderful time. She looked at Nate with glowing eyes. It's really you. Captain Bowditch, FFA and AM. I'm very proud of you. She blinked back sudden tears. Oh, Nate, it's been so long. Nate's arm tightened around her. Somewhere out of the past, a voice whispered, A long time to sail by ash breeze. Was it awfully hard, Polly asked. Not too bad, Nate told her. Rough weather sometimes, but I'll say this for it. I was never becalmed. That's the end. I'll uh, pick up, pick out another bu uh, book soon, and uh, we'll we'll start reading it. Meantime, click down there, like, subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this story as much as I did. Love you. Bye bye.